Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having inspiring conversations with passionate product people. Now, when it comes to inspiration, sometimes we all need a little bit of extra help. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know I'm a passionate advocate for mentorship. I've tried to do my part, but there are always more people looking for help. So because of this, I've teamed up with a buddy to help more mentors and mentees find each other. If you want to find out more, check out onenightinproduct.com slash mentor, where you can sign up to be a mentor, a mentee, or both. That's onenightinproduct.com slash mentor. And by the way, we are really currently on the lookout for more mentors specifically. On tonight's episode, we ask ourselves, is product management easier or harder when all your customers have PhDs and are working on some of the hardest scientific problems out there? And ponder whether there are exceptions to the rule that product managers don't need industry expertise. We also consider which product principles are sacred cows, which might as well be hamburgers, and talk about some coping strategies for the introverts among us to deal with that next big product presentation. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Dan Chapman. Dan's a scientist turned product manager turned product leader and also an Arsenal football club fan who's escaped the decline of his beloved team by fleeing the country entirely and taking up residence in Boston where he's no doubt wowing everyone with his flawless New England accent. Dan says he could eat pizza for the rest of his life but he's even more passionate about product management and says he's got opinions about just about all of it. So I'm anticipating we'll have an opinionated conversation tonight and hopefully put the world of product management right while we're at it. Hi Dan, how are you tonight? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you for the invite. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I'm glad to have you here so we can laugh at Arsenal just that little bit more. <laughs> hey, they got better since I, uh, since I left, so uh, you know, <laughs> may, maybe I was a bad omen. You were holding them back. So first things first, you are a director and product line leader for Merck. Now, I'm sure everyone's heard of Merck, but what are you working on there and what product line are you leading? Yeah, that's correct. And for perfect clarification purposes, that is Merck & Co., based in Kenilworth, New Jersey, USA, otherwise known outside of the US and Canada by MSD, not to be confused with the other Merck that's out there. And there's a a hundred year old story around why there are two of them. And they started off as one company and were split as a result of some, I guess, political and and world war affairs over the period and uh, slowly diverged and Merck and Co. US was rebought by uh, another one of the Merck family that had moved out to the US. So there's an interesting story there for mm, history buffs. I was going to say, it sounds like that could be awkward at family parties, but yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, I think unfortunately it was a long time ago and I hope they've all got over it. <laughs> you never know. So what are you working on there? Yeah, so so right now I'm, I'm an internally facing products person, which is, it was new when I took it on. My main role is to lead a team that enables our scientists internally. So we look after a lot of the core tools that our scientists use day to day. So they would use things like electronic laboratory notebooks and the systems they use to capture the science that they're doing. We manage all of those and are really looking at it as a change from what has historically been a more project centric organization and and running small things year on year with budgets to a more holistic view. So that's been a journey internally for us to move from that. And we're getting settled at the moment. We are still kind of mid transformation a little bit, but it's, it's a, it's been a fun journey and it's good to work with the scientists closely. Yeah. Well, we'll come on to the scientists again in a minute, but my research tells me, and I'm hoping it's the right Merck that you're working for like a $50 billion revenue company. With something Sounds like that, right? Yeah, we're a, we're a we're a big company. We're about sixty thousand people, I think, at the last yeah. count. Scientist wise, we serve about six thousand scientists yeah. in total. And so, the scientists I work with particularly are the the folks really at this, the discovery end. They're the ones not quite sitting around, but you know, certainly working out in terms of <laughs> sitting in a bath waiting for that eureka moment. Yeah, right? exactly. There's a little bit of that that goes on, I think, but you know. Looking for, you know, the next cure for cancer or Alzheimer's or uh, heart disease or you name it. I think, you know, we're really at that early stage. So, you know, a drug can take 10 plus years to come to market. Yeah. And the attrition rate is somewhere in the region of about, you know, one might make it out of about 10 or even 100,000 candidates to get there. So it's, it's a really tough process to get there. 
there's a lot of hurdles to get through along the way in terms of showing proof, showing that it works, showing that it's not evil, hmm. showing that it's better than the therapies that are out there today, and also just proving to you know the regulatory bodies out there that it does what it says it does, and the, the systems that they're using, which is kind of where I fit in, are doing what they're supposed to do and work as they're supposed to do and are under control. There are a lot of extra kind of factors there in terms of regulatory concerns and also just kind of burden of proof that we have to work through from and consider as as part of our product offerings. Yeah, I mean, actually, one of the things, I mean, I was going to ask it a bit later, but it seems really relevant to that topic is around things like the Theranos debacle and stuff like that, where you've kind of got people trying to bring that move fast and break things mentality, you know, the sort of thing that you might bring to the or the approach that you might bring to building some kind of social media add on or something like that, and trying to bring that to the high stakes world of medical science. Like, I'm assuming, well, first of all, I'm assuming that that is kind of almost like a cautionary tale for your team now. But like, I guess the question I was going to ask later is like, how much of that kind of move fast and break things mentality, sort of agile, lean stuff is there within the company at all, given what you've just said? (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting, you know, I think, yeah, there's definitely a desire to move faster. I don't know if fast for us means fast as it would for other folks. (laughs) Life science as a whole is, it's a very deliberate industry. It's because of the regulation, because of the direct impact on people's health as a whole, you know, it's, it's, it's a very conservative environment in which to work. And so, yes, there are regulatory hurdles. There is, to some degree, you know, it, I mean, there's institutional inertia, naturally cautious. I mean, the one that kicked all of kind of, especially the, the tight regulation off was back with the, I think it was the, the thalidomide yeah. uh, issue, right, which was way, way back when. And the science behind that is really interesting. But I mean, ultimately, what that did was it really kind of caused a tightening of kind of the scrutiny, and rightly so. And so, you know, within that, life science as a whole is pretty conservative in in a lot of areas and so that that move fast and break things is a challenge for us and then on top of that you know most you know the companies in that space are large there are processes people like processes because process means predictability yeah and predictability means compliance yeah and compliance is good it means we don't get told off <laughs> so that's pervasive and so yeah there there is an element of yeah, okay, we want to move fast, but what can we move? And you know, how do we move? And, and can we do this? And can we do that? And some of it is, can I work with the system? Can we change things? And there's a little bit of kind of wisdom to know what you can and can't do within that. So it's, it's a tricky balance. Yeah, I was going to say though, like, how does product management specifically work in a big company like that with all of those regulations and that conservatism? I mean, it sounds like that's the sort of environment where you're going to end up using basically things like scaled, agile, safe, things like that, and really kind of top-down procedures. Like, is that fair? Or are you kind of uh, at least able to be agile in the way that you deliver things when you're kind of on a, a regular basis? You went and used the magic word early, didn't you? <laughs> so I am not a fan of safe. So I will say that very politically at this point, I suppose. You'll probably get me going a bit later on. <laughs> so safe is one of those that, you know, is, in my opinion, and I'll couch that before I uh, make a bunch of consultants irate, <laughs> it's waterfall in agile clothes in that sense. Yep. And I totally understand why it is attractive to large organizations because of the illusion of predictability and the, the challenge of trying to do product and be agile in a large organization is... Really, I mean, especially for us, because we're a service organization internally pointing. It's not like we're the core business. The core business is providing drugs to patients. Yeah. So we're enabling our scientists. The rest of the organization is pretty waterfall. The finances and things are all annual budgeting. And and if you try and do something different within this, then you end up out of step or it's a mismatch. And I've encountered that in a couple of places. So, you know, it's not just within, say, where I am now. It's something I've experienced in other roles that I've been in before where you go through that transformation and the rest of the organization isn't in that mode. And then you're trying to then trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And it's difficult 
So I get why safe is attractive because on the outside, the wrapper on the outside is all very waterfall and it fits. It's also very directive and top down and yep. prevents change and all of the stuff that are the reasons why you want to be agile and in a product mindset to start with. So yeah, it's not for me. I know that there are colleagues out there in other parts of the world that are using it. I can't speak for how successful they are or not with that. It's not something that I would relish. But yeah. <laughs> Being very gentle on that. <laughs> so just for the record, you're not using it at the moment. We are not using safe. There no. you go. And I also have to say for the record that keeping safe consultants happy or not annoyed is definitely low on my list of priorities as well. <laughs> I figured I was in safe company there. <laughs> no pun intended. Yes. It, well, yes, exactly. The opposite of safe company. The opposite, yes. I, you know, I think with within that as well, it's there are other companies out there and, 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 and I'm aware of other competitive companies out there that are using it. The challenge for me always is the overhead. And, you know, the, you, know I mean, you always see the, whatever the latest picture of the safe mechanism is. And it makes my eyes hurt just thinking about it. Yeah. And, you know, that level of overhead and, and you know, how can you move fast and break stuff <laughs> without that? But, yep. yeah, I can see where people fall into that trap because if you really like process and it gives you that safety blanket of process. We're still working things out a little bit. So, you know, I'm not going to claim that perfect agile exists kind of in my life every day because I don't think it does. I don't really know what perfect agile is in the grand sense of things. But the goal for us is to try to work in a flexible manner, to be responsive to change. If the last two years have taught us nothing else is that the world can change on its head in a very short space of time when you need to respond to it and try to set ourselves up to meet such changes. We are trying to move towards a more outcome-driven approach rather than outputs. Yep. So we are working on various iterations of objectives and key results, so the kind of the OKR methodology. That's actually quite tricky to do in terms of getting things right, and especially at an organization the scale as we are. I often use the analogy of it, it's kind of like trying to change the engine in the car in the outside lane of the motorway. 65 miles an hour yeah you're going to keep moving whether you like it or not and you try not to lose some parts on the way as you go along so that's a challenge and trying to you know match huh. work that is already moving and bringing new new methodologies like okrs match that it does kind of tend you to kind of think well this key result is a bit specific maybe we should bring that up but ultimately for us to link our work that we're doing in our teams through to problems that we're solving and match those problems up to the outcomes that we are trying to achieve and, and match those to the key results. That's that's where we're trying to get to. And, and if we can do that correctly, maybe, you know, it'll uh, stop us going down the, uh, the safe path. Uh, fingers crossed. I'll keep giving you positive thoughts. But you've worked in this industry one way or another, seemingly for your whole career. And I know you studied chemistry at university as well. So I guess that supposes that you've always been some kind of scientist at heart. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I guess. So I started off life actually as an engineer. So well, classic. Yeah. So well, well, engineer in engineer in the mechanical engineer sense. So um, oh, okay. I'll I started take it back. off. Yeah, <laughs> I started off originally. So I, I set off from my uh, my A levels, kind of my my higher education is bright eyed and bushy tailed, and, and went off to do aer aeronautical engineering. Oh, wow. About three months into that process, I realized that it wasn't going to work. So I ended up taking some time out and thinking about what I'd done. <laughs> but through that process, it's interesting. One of the guys that I ended up talking to through that, that interview process had turned around and said, through one of the, the interviews, and I think it was, I studied engineering at Bath for, for a semester and then dropped out. But I think I was at Brunel. And he asked me the question, you know, why, why do you want to be an engineer? And and I said, well, you know, I'm kind of I, I look at stuff and I want to know how it works. Yeah. And he turned around to me and he said, hmm, it's interesting. Why do you say that? And he said, well, if you were really, really an engineer, you'd look at something and not ask how it works, but how do you make it better? If you're looking at it and wondering how it works, maybe you're a scientist. Huh. And so, yeah, so th those words kind of wrong with me. Uh, Fast forward six or eight months as I was actually kind of getting my feet into the course and uh, was finding myself spending more time with 
my body's chemistry homework than I was with my own as an engineer. I should have maybe read the signs back then and, uh, and made an immediate switch. <laughs> but yeah, I studied chemistry after a, you know, a year or so out and, uh, and went back and ended up in Newcastle in the northeast of the UK. Studied up there for a few years. Through that, I did a work placement with what was Glaxo Welcome at the time. I went through the, their merger period with Smith Klein Beecham to become GSK today. Yep. And you know, enjoyed the work there, but also kind of said to myself, yeah, I like being in the industry. Maybe I don't want to be stuck, you know, stuck in the lab forever. And so when I finished up, I said, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and do, get myself some business education as well. So I did a, an MA in international business management and got out and thought, right, let's get back into that life science industry. And let's go and do something interesting like marketing or something like that. <laughs> and then realized I had bills to pay. <laughs> so called up my old boss and was like, well, have you got any work? So, well, you know, we've, yeah, we've got some stuff. It's, it's contract to start with, but, you know, I, we, we can get you in and, and what have you. And then I blinked and it was like seven or eight years later. Huh. And uh, I was like, okay, where's that plan gone? So I got the opportunity to step outside into a different role. And I was doing more IT stuff as a lab scientist by then anyway. I was doing a lot of kind of level one support for some of the local systems that we were using. And I was leading the, the global kind of lead user team for, a, for an application there. So I got picked up by a software and instrument vendor in the space and uh, joined their field marketing team. So I did field marketing, pre-sales technical, kind of consultancy, business development for four and a half years there. And through that company, then moved into product management. So having been plugging it and marketing it and selling it for a while, kind of got to the point, huh, you know, I, I really... Yeah, I want to make some, I want to make some more decisions here. I want to get closer to the product. And uh, so they said to me, "You can do it in the UK, you can do it in Germany, or you can do it in the US." Hey, by the way, US is head office. Hint, hint. <laughs> and so you know, they very nicely picked us up and moved us over. And that was like seven years ago. And that was me into product management from there on in. And uh, I, yeah, it's it's been a really good move. I, I kind of feel like I've found my people. If I look back across my career and things and even with various other activities and the way I'd kind of approached things in the past, even now looking back, I realized that I was playing the role of product manager in kind of in that sense without even knowing it and you know, building a yeah. training package for one of the systems that I looked after when I was at GSK. And it was, hey, you know what? I was sitting with the designer and we were working it through and we had our goals and we were working every couple of days in iterations of how we do it and what are we trying to get to? And I'm like, huh, some of that activity looks familiar now in my new lens. <laughs> so I feel like I've found, found the spot that really kind of makes me interested and gives me the variety of different stuff to get into day by day. And, and over the last couple of years, kind of moving from a team contributor into more of a product leader. Yeah. That offers its own challenges as well in terms of making that jump. And that's, I know it's something you've been through yeah. kind of over the last few years as well. That's, that's an interesting challenge in itself. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And we'll, we'll come back to leadership in a minute. But before we go there, I really wondered, like product managers, business type people, people that are looking not just at the technical matters, but also looking at the go-to-market plans and some of the other stuff that you can do as product manager. There can sometimes be a bit of a gap between the way that product managers think about things and the way that the, for example, engineers think about things. And I'm wondering mm. if that's an even bigger gap when you're talking to very, very clever scientists. What's the relationship like between your team and those heavy science people that are in there doing all these tests to try to make life-changing drugs? Yeah. Do you know, it's interesting, right? There are some things that parallel really well, and there are some things that are, are wildly different. Especially when, if you're, especially working to convince scientists or you're marketing to scientists, that is a very different prospect. Right? <laughs> I don't know. I was about to say we are. I don't know if I qualify as a scientist anymore after so many years <laughs> out of the saddle. Maybe I will use the we for the collective we so that I tar myself with the same brush as I go along. There you go. We are a cynical bunch. <laughs> especially when it comes to the typical marketing and proof statements and and things like that. So, um, so much that there, you know, there, I mean, there are even books written about it. So 
there's a guy called Hamid Garnadan who's on the West Coast in the US who's who's written a couple of books, one of which was titled Persuading Scientists. Huh. So even yeah, even down to that, to that somebody's actually you know, deemed themselves to write a book about it. So, you know, they they're a tough bunch sometimes and in, in that sense. In other areas there are lots of parallels. And incidentally, I think scientists make really good product managers, but maybe we'll, you know, we'll touch that in a minute. <laughs> but kind of with us, in terms of, you know, we're trying to get to a kind of a more experimentation mindset and yeah. we are following a path of work and don't know where it's going to end up. There are massive parallels in the work that they do in the lab in terms of the scientific method itself, starting out with, uh, hey, we've got a hypothesis, let's get out there and try and disprove it, etc. So there's massive parallels down there in that sense. And, and if you can have the language in, in the conversation in those sense, then everybody comes, yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah. They walk into the lab to start an experiment or a series of experiments. They've got no idea what direction it's going to go in. And hey, you know what? Sometimes when we do that with a product and we open, hey, we're going to start this feature, we're in the same boat and they totally get that. So it makes that discussion a lot easier with them than it would be, say, with... I don't know, maybe some folks in a more predictable industry. Mm. So, yeah, it's an interesting mix in that sense. And, you know, whether, so, yeah, right now I'm facing internally and I'm selling internally a little bit. And, you know, having an internal audience is an interesting situation to be in. I've also yeah. been on the vendor side where I'm actively selling and trying to get scientists to part with their money in that sense, you know, and the various gatekeepers in enterprise b2b sales right yep yeah so you know you've got the finance guy you've got to convince you've got the scientist and their boss in and the lab actually using it you've got the quality people that you've got to get over there's different types of conversations you have with each of those people to get over the relevant hurdles but yeah scientists generally i think as long as you can kind of get into their heads a little bit it's not too bad the challenge and i know this is some, this is where i kind of describe myself sometimes as a walking hypocrite for product management in that space, it's a really tough nut to crack in terms of empathy. Yep. And so I firmly believe that product skills as a domain is perfectly transferable and we can move from domain to domain with maybe not complete ease, but we should be able to transfer those skills and pick those up as we go along. Yeah. Life science is one of those that I guess I always kind of then hold myself up and say, yeah, and there's kind of an exception to the rule. And I don't think it's insurmountable, but the learning curve is so vertical Yeah. as part of that. To put somebody in to say, you know what, they've come in from a completely unrelated environment and then say, right, in order to get this tool done, you have to work with a scientist. And hey, by the way, the unit operations in there it really helps if you've at least got a BSc in chemistry to even wrap your brain around the concepts. Yeah. And a PhD would be really useful, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a massive learning curve to put somebody in at that sense. So I always struggle with that one and say, yes, broadly, I believe that we're transferable. There are certain circumstances where that's really hard and life science is one of them. Yeah, no, it does sound kind of full on. Again, I'm fairly fundamentalist when it comes to believing that product managers can be product managers anywhere because of course product management is a skill and it's something that people should be able to do and take different places but at the same time it does sound fairly terrifying trying to have discovery conversations about things that i have no idea about so i guess yeah that's probably not something a udemy course can <laughs> bridge right not so much i mean ultimately you can boil it down to you know as a unit operation yeah. You take this data, you do something with it, you make a decision, and then you push that somewhere else. Yeah. You can boil it down to that level of simplicity, but once you get beyond that, then it gets really complex. So switching tracks slightly, although kind of related in a way, because we're talking about obviously a lot of those conversations that you have to have, and obviously product management in general is a very cross-functional discipline. There's lots of collaboration there's lots of presentations there's lots of interviewing of customers or internal stakeholders in your case mm -hmm. but you described yourself before this call as a bit of an introvert yeah and you know that's definitely something that i that resonates with me i would classify myself as an introvert or maybe one of those mythical extroverted introverts or mm. ambiverts or whatever you call them but do you think that being an introvert is a barrier and something that you have to surmount or do you think that introversion is something that you can kind of turn and i don't know use to your advantage mm. as you're kind of navigating the organization 
uh, or navigating your career in product management? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it's a double-edged sword in that sense. But I, I do think that introverts make really good product managers. And it, it ties in back into, I guess, some of the commentary in terms of, I think, scientists make really good product managers as well. And scientists and introversions, very often, I mean, you, you kind of see them kind of side by side in that sense. Yeah, There is a kind of innate self-reflection that kind of comes on board with being an introvert and an affinity for throwing yourself at data and an analysis that I think is really helpful for a product person, particularly around kind of the data analysis that a lot of the drivers why I think scientists make good product managers. I don't bump into many of them. And I'm feeling that quite painfully at the moment because I'm trying to hire. And, and so, you know, the, the market is thin out there at the moment in that sense. But the social element can be hard. So kind of like you, I don't know if I'm a fully, fully ambivert in that sense, but I know <laughs> if, you, if you believe the Myers-Briggs type indicator type stuff that I'm sure somebody will happily inform me is complete twaddle. <laughs> but yeah, if, I, I've always come out in one of those as what they term kind of a social introvert. Yeah. So I, I, I've got the ability to turn it on. And kind of, you know, do the, hey, look at me, I'm a chocolate biscuit, you know, and, <laughs> you know, maybe I learned some of that through being in a customer facing marketing role. Right. But it drains me. Yeah. And, you know, I would always kind of come back from, you know, a customer event or a conference or something and get onto the plane at the end of the, at the end of the week and just be kind of let out of breath and be like, oh, man, this, yeah. that was hard. Okay. And now I need some quiet time. So the flip side of that is, is managing that focus time and thinking time more aggressively than maybe some other folks have to do. On top of all of the multitasking and the context switching and, and kind of the normal stuff that goes in there. And that's something I really struggle with as a product person is preserving that focus time, time to think, time to yeah. not be on back-to-back -back video or calls for six, seven hours a day, get to the end of the day and just be completely pride and full yeah and have enough of myself left at the end of the day for family and fun and, and whatever else right and i think yeah i think it, i think it really can be a superpower for product managers i think there's also an extra ele element of self-care that goes with that as a result yeah no i absolutely agree and and i definitely feel it myself this whole idea that you kind of have to work up to being able to be in one of those situations like being the public face of yourself and again, as you've said, kind of just getting tired, like I think I explained it once as like, yeah, you spend all day doing all of that stuff and having it on, but there's sort of a, a time limit on it. And also you kind of just kind of sag when you're in the lift on the way out sort of things. So, yeah. But, you know, I guess, you know, it's just one of those things that, I mean, I'm sure many people suffer from that in, in different ways. And, you know, it's, I think it's just about what you want to do. Like if you want to put yourself in that position or you put yourself in that situation, then those situations are going to arise and you're going to have to find ways to cope with it. And I guess that's a question then for you is like, what are some of your coping strategies in that sort of situation when, mm. I don't know, you've got a big presentation to do or you've got a big meeting with a new stakeholder or an external person or some kind of something that would make a classic introvert just... Wither and die, right? Exactly, yeah, because, you know, this is such an uncomfortable situation. Like, are there ways that you've either managed to fake it or ways that you've built your kind of resistance or your i don't know ambivert muscles to be able to get through those situations or mm. do you kind of just take it as it comes and just do your best a little bit of column a a little bit of column b i guess <laughs> in that sense so being prepared always helps so you know the the, the classic you know preparation and yeah getting your message clear and you know, if you're if you're doing a presentation, kind of walk it through and what have you. Yep. I've never been a massive fan of you know the the perfect walk through word for word in that sense, but certainly having a really clear run through in terms of what's my messaging, what do I need to keep reiterating on, where do I need this to go, and and kind of have a structure in my head around the messaging through that. That's definitely been something that I've always worked on and and tactics to use. The other part is, you know, uh, just getting used to being uncomfortable. And yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I think back to some of my early days as a as a vendor, kind of on the vendor side in that sense. And we 
we were on our way out to India for the first, my first kind of long, long haul trip. So back in the days, I worked as part of the European organization, which for, for my org meant Europe, Middle East and India, because geography was clearly a strong suit. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going out there. And, you know, I needed, you know, I've, I'm, I'm good. I've had all my extra injections and things, all of the things that I didn't have topped up for travel and everything that they recommend you go for. And I'm on my way to the airport in the uh, in the taxi, and I'm due to multiple presentations over a couple of weeks in various cities around India with my boss alongside me. The first one was, I think this was a Sunday lunchtime. We were going to land in, in India at like three in the morning in Mumbai. And the first presentation set was, you know, a seminar in, in a hotel there at 9 a.m. that morning. So get to bed for five hours, get up, get going, you know. So my boss sent me a, a note uh, and text and I'm in the car. Hit traffic. Might be squeaky. We'll keep you posted. Okay. Well, okay. So we let it go for about half an hour and then, and then she called me like, yeah, I'm stuck in traffic. If I don't make it, I will send you the presentations that I was going to give tomorrow and you're going to have to either give them or, or split them with a the local team and work out who of you are going to do that. And good luck. By the way, I've only just learned the stuff that I was going to give and it was the first time in front of about 150 people to do that. And, you know, they're the kind of things that I guess you just pass through and learn a little bit of think on your feet and panic and then get over it <laughs> in, in as much as, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to land. I'm not going to have access to them until I land and I'm going to have to cram. And then I'm going to have to be able to do this in front of these people because I haven't got a choice. And, you know, or the other one is you know, you're out on tour in places like that. And then on, on the way back from somewhere, say, oh, yeah, we're going to make a stop at this place on the way through. They'd like you to talk about this. Okay. Open up the laptop in the back of the car and sh 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 grab the, <laughs> you know, pull, pull the relevant slide deck together and off you go. And the little mantras in the back of your head that I know this material. I'm standing here. I am the expert. I control the direction this goes in. I can control the narrative. Being able to manage and deflect, in some cases, various questions or the, the various tactics around, yep, okay, that's a really great question, and take a breath and give yourself space to think and things like that. A lot of that, what, if you can kind of get through that, yeah. then it takes a lot of kind of the, the internal pressure and the internal panic out. Once you can get over that panic, then you're in a much better place in that sense. So, yeah, get used to being uncomfortable. Give yourself some tactics that when you are uncomfortable to deal with it. Yeah, just get out there and remember that, you know, you're in control. I mean, they're kind of the mantras that are always sitting in my mind. Yeah, well, some excellent advice there for introverts around the world. And you told me recently you want people to be firm on principles, but be flexible on how you meet them. Mm. So what are some of those principles that you're firmest on and what does being flexible look like in those situations? Yeah, it's a great question and timely in terms of, so, you know, we're, we're trying to move towards this more kind of product-led model right now from more of a project-led one. And having been through uh, previous things around agile transformations and things in the past, they're really pertinent kind of questions right now. So, you know, firmly held principles for me, I mean, I I always will get a little bit frustrated by those folks out there that are totally black and white and you know if you're not doing it in this particular fashion then you're not doing it yeah or if it doesn't look like this then you know you're a failure or whatever else for me it's always right why are we here why you know, what, what are we trying to do for me right now it's how do i make my scientists more successful how do i make their lives easier how i get there it's broadly irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. They don't care as long as their lives are getting easier and they're getting better tools and what have you. So, yeah, certainly keep in context, you know, the famous product manager kind of mantra is why, um, <laughs> you know, and it's always, you know, um, as, a, as, as somebody with a, with a toddler in the house that is slowly approaching that kind of <laughs> period in their life where it's all going to be why, why, why. There's an element of that in kind of the product managers in terms of, you know, you get the long story and you're like, okay, so why are we doing this? Yeah. What value does it give us? 
what does it mean for our end users in that sense? So, I mean, certainly in terms of principles, I mean, I'm, I'm always going to come back to, number one, why are we doing it? The other part of that for me is around being transparent and being honest and straight with decision making, even if sometimes that's uncomfortable. Generally, my mantra is actually, if, if it feels a little bit uncomfortable, we're probably about right in terms of transparency because it should <laughs> feel a little bit awkward. But having very honest conversations with be it stakeholders or people around you in either why you're doing something or why we're not doing something or what we get out of that, I think that's, you know, that's definitely a principle for me in the, for, for within product as to what we get into. Do I get hung up on how agile we are? <laughs> not particularly right I, I i do firmly believe that agile is a really great complement or the agile mindset is a really great complement for products because what it does is shortens our our learning loop agile done properly is a learning engine so it shortens our feedback loops and, and helps us as product people make better decisions yep. do i particularly care if it's scrum kanban xp lean you know in in that sense no, not really. And you know what? And in some cases, you know what? Waterfall is perfectly adequate as well, right? In in certain cases. Ooh. I know. I know, I know that's controversial, right? But in, in, <laughs> in, some, in some cases, you know, I'll even sit there and say, look, if it's a well-bounded thing, so like within our group, we do upgrades. You know, I've, because a lot, of the, a lot of what we do is commercial off-the-shelf software, a lot of our internal product management work is, is vendor management and working with COTS software our build versus buy bias is completely backwards to how you are if you're building something <laughs> and so if we're just going from one version to the next do i have to go and do it again do i have to go and do a bunch of discovery no not really do we have to have daily sprints and and what have you and iterations and chase things down i mean we can but because you know we, we're starting at a known point we're ending at a known point we know what we've got to do in between might be controversial, but you know, does, does it matter if you run it waterfall with a as a as more of a project in that sense? As long as it gets us there and it's it's well bounded, I'm all right with that. I'm a pragmatist, yeah. Some of that as well is part of being in a you know in a bigger organization as well. I've you know I've never been in an organization less than about six thousand people. Yeah, that's the smallest organization I've ever been in. So sometimes you've got to know when to fight and when to not and. You know, digging my heels in over something that really in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter. I, I, I lose I lose a certain level of kind of political capital, I guess, about that. And, you know, I'm, it's, uh, I hate politics in, in that sense. But the reality is, is that, you know, there is there is a certain amount of it wherever you are. I'd rather save my, you know, the goodwill around it for something that really matters. Yeah. And, 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 and chase somebody down for something that you know, I'm really passionate about that makes a really big difference to what we're doing. So, I mean, I guess, yeah, my, and, and maybe that's another principle there that I fall back on there, right, which is, you know, being careful where you put your feet in in that sense. So <laughs> uh, every so often I dig out, um, I don't know if you've ever seen them, there's um, the US General Colin Powell, if you remember him from... Yep. So he has a, a set of uh, 13 rules that uh, I go back to every so often, and uh, they're always a they're always a good look up. I kind of feel like it's a a really good mantra for uh, for a product manager in in that sense to kind of walk through. I mean, I, I forget the order that they're in, but there's kind of you know, get mad and then get over it. Um, <laughs> don't yeah, what's the other one? Don't get your ego so close to a position that when you know when the position goes, your ego goes with it, and uh, a few other things. There's some really there's some really good ones in there for and it, you know if you look at it through a product management lens, you're like oh, it kind of resonates. Yeah. So yeah, I go back to those every so often. Fair enough. I'll uh, dig them out and see what I can find out and what I can learn. But where can people find you after this if they want to chat about product management or life sciences or try and mm. get you to do one of your best Boston accents? <laughs> You're not getting that one out of me. It's it, uh, it, it's it's awful. I'm I'm I'm, I'm too dyed in the wool for uh, for that one. It was too late for change. Yeah, if you want to find me, so I'm around on LinkedIn in there. I'm sure you'll tag the relevant links in on there. Yep. I'm a, I'm a big fan of product Twitter at the moment. Twitter as a whole can be a bit of a swamp, but the product <laughs> community on, on Twitter is a, 
a wonderful little oasis of fabulous people like yourself that will uh, uh, participate and, uh, and, and help people out and really just act as a nice little community. So uh, and I've, I've made a pact with myself to try and be a little bit more kind of active and, and share some things along the way as, uh, as I go along and, and participate a bit more. So you, yeah, I, either of those two, you'll find me. Well, as you say, I'll make sure to link those into the show notes and hopefully some people will come and force you to participate a bit more. Sounds good. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. Obviously, really interesting to get the life sciences version of products and start to dig into some of the challenges and some of the opportunities you got there and some of the things you can and can't do. Obviously, we'll stay in touch. But yeah, as for now, thanks for taking the time. Awesome. Thank you for having me. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favourite podcast app and make sure you share with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night.